morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Gina Hawkins, and I am the Chief of Police for Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, as well as the co-chair for the American Bar Association's Law Enforcement Committee. Today's panel is co-hosted by the Law Enforcement Committee and the American Bar Association's Legal Education Police Practices Consortium. The consortium is a group of 60 member law schools across the country dedicated to collaboratively developing, implementing, and evaluating police practices which strengthen the rule of law and protect all populations across the United States. Drawing on its geographic diversity and the convening power of the ABA, the consortium aims to become a national repository of policing research, legislation, current events, and points of contact to support law schools in advancing effective, racially equitable policing and public safety in their community. The consortium works closely with the Law Enforcement Committee to identify and research areas of interest and need to both, the needs of both academics and police. I'm pleased to, to, to introduce the session today entitled Public Safety for Tomorrow the role of mental health clinicians in responding to people in crisis. This theme is, immense, is of immense importance to both the legal and policing profession. As we attempt to identify ways to equitably protect citizens while fostering a sense of safety and security for the entire community. I've served as the Chief of Police since August of 2017, and during that time have observed and been a part of incredible change processes world of policing. A lot of the changes I've been making directly relate to our discussion today. My department created a mental health liaison <coughs> position to focus on a multitude of calls for services that my officers repeatedly go out to and to minimize their response while simultaneously providing citizens with the resources they need. The mental health liaison will also train my entire department with crisis intervention training. Although this position has only been in place for a short time, the benefits have been profound for my department and my community. I look forward to hearing and learning from our panelists today to determine what is currently known in this space and where additional research and work is needed. I'm particularly interested to hear if and how to continue partnerships <coughs> with lawyers and police can further advance our understanding of suitable community safety responses. To moderate our discussion today, I'm pleased to introduce to you Roger Fairfax, who is Dean of American University Washington College of Law, one of the 60 member law schools to the ABA Legal Education Policing Practice Consortium. Dean Fairfax previously served as the Patricia, Patricia Roberts Harris Research Professor and founding director of the Criminal Law and Policy Initiatives at George Washington University Law School. His scholarship has been published in books and leading journals and he has taught courses and conducted research on criminal law and procedure, professional responsibility and ethics, criminal justice policy and reforms, racial justice and grand jury and internal investigations. Prior to his career in academia, he practiced law with the firm of Old Melody, I messed up, and Myers LLP in Washington, D.C., and served as a federal prosecutor during the Attorney General's Honors Program in the Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Justice Division of the United States Department of Justice. He began his legal career as a law clerk to Judge Patty B. Saris of the United States District Courts for the District of, for the District of Massachusetts and Judge Judith W. Rogers of the U.S. Courts of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Dean Fairfax has served on the board of the National Bar Association, the Southern Eastern the Southeastern Association of Law Schools, and the Maryland Office of Public Defender. He is an elected member of the American Law Institute and a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, and currently serves on the board of the National Institute for Trial Advocacy and the Historical Society of the D.C. Circuit. He graduated with honors from Harvard College, the University of London, and Harvard Law School, where he was an NAACP Legal Defense Fund chairman and Sterling Scholar and the editor of the Harvard Law Review. Without further ado, Dean Roger. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Hawkins, for that more than generous uh, introduction.
introduction. You really are reading from my mother's diary. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I, I want to thank Justin Walker, who's out here somewhere. Yes. Um, uh, and everyone who worked so hard to organize uh, this uh, panel on such a timely and important topic. And I want to uh, thank the panelists uh, from whom we will be learning uh, this morning. And of course, thanks to all of you uh, for being here uh, this morning. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm the Dean of the American University of Washington College of Law. And we've had such a strong relationship with the American Bar Association. And as Dean, I'm proud that WCL has had a particularly strong relationship with the criminal justice section of the ABA. Um, of course, uh, the section's Tazewitz Rader Award is named after our uh, dear late colleague, Andy Tazewitz, who served on the faculty of the Washington College of Law. And not one, but two members of the WCL faculty are winners of uh, the Tazewitz Rader Award, Angela Davis and Cynthia Jones. Um, and we're also proud, uh, as the chief mentioned, to be one of the member schools uh, in the ABA Police Practices uh, Consortium. Uh, one aspect of my biography that wasn't mentioned is that I had personally had um, deep involvement with the criminal justice section. I'm a former member of the section council, I'm a former co-chair of uh, the academics committee and the ADR, restorative justice committee of the section. I have served on the diversity and inclusion committee and the state policy implementation or smart on crime uh, task force. And I currently serve on the editorial board of Criminal Justice Magazine. So I have a real appreciation uh, for the work of this section and for the Fall Institute. And it's such, this institute is such an important part of advancing the conversation around critical issues in the administration of criminal justice. And I've had the privilege of speaking a number of times on panels at this Fall Institute over the years. And as I was prepared for this, I was looking through my papers and actually um, realized that I spoke 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, um, uh, at the 2012 Criminal Justice Section Fall Institute on a plenary panel moderated by Professor Sarah Sunbill at, at Duke University Law School. And um, uh, the panel was entitled Overcriminalization and Over Reliance on Incarceration. And I looked at my notes and my talking points um, uh, for that panel. And I talked about the incarceration explosion of the prior 40 years and the fact that we had strained law enforcement budgets and staggering rates of incarceration and real and perceived inequities in the administration of criminal justice. And I said, it is beyond debate that the American criminal justice system is long overdue for an overhaul. And I, I used my time um, at that panel uh, to talk about a newly packaged approach to criminal justice uh, reform, smart on crime. And um, I talked about the fact that it had gained traction in policy circles in recent years. And um, the smart on crime philosophy, which emphasizes a fairness and accuracy in the administration of criminal justice. It focuses on recidivism, reducing alternatives to incarceration and other traditional sanctions. It focuses on effective preemptive mechanisms for preventing criminal behavior. Also focuses on the transition of formerly incarcerated individuals to law-abiding and productive lives. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, it focuses on evidence-based and data-driven assessments on the costliness, efficiency, and effectiveness of criminal justice uh, policies. And I talked a lot about how this was a refreshing uh, break from the the old sort of binary, tough on crime, soft on crime uh, that we had seen in our politics for far too long. And I um, said a lot of good things about this um, promising young politician who had just won the race for California Attorney General after having served as the DA in San Francisco and who was touting a smart on crime. And I also quoted the then Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder who said, and I want to um, share these words that he delivered to the American Bar Association Convention um, just a little while earlier. And he said, there is no doubt that we must be tough on crime, but we must also commit ourselves to being smart on crime. Getting smart on crime requires talking openly about which policies have worked and which have not. 
and we do not, I'm sorry, we do have to do so um, without worrying about being labeled as too soft or too hard on crime. Getting smart on crime means moving behind useless labels and catchphrases and instead relying on science and data to shape policy. And getting smart on crime means thinking about crime in context, not just reacting to the criminal act, but developing the government's ability to enhance public safety before the crime is committed and after the former offender is returned to society. At that time, that was extraordinary to hear a sitting attorney general say those words, no matter you know, what um, you, you might think of those words or whether they go far enough. Again, you have a sitting attorney general of the United States um, uh, changing the conversation. And um, for the past several years, that conversation um, uh, has uh, developed and has focused in large part on policing and has also focused on a subset um, uh, of policing, and that is the relationship between policing and mental health. And uh, today, we are going to be exploring um, uh, questions like the value of mental health clinicians and responding to calls for service, uh, particularly for historically over-policed uh, communities. So we know that jurisdictions are implementing programs uh, in this regard in a variety of ways, including sending clinicians in lieu of police officers, uh, providing enhanced training to law enforcement to better um, support their understanding of the community, and responding to behavioral health calls for service in addition to armed officers. So this panel will look at the history of these approaches, and we'll also look at grown body of evaluation as it relates to the efficacy of dual response models, as well as sending mental health clinicians in lieu of law enforcement. And we'll also look at the potential for expansion and practice and policy in the years to come. And I am thrilled that the ABA has taken seriously its position um, as a key convener and platform for thought leadership. And that is what we have with us this morning, thought leaders. Um, so I will introduce um, our panelists, and then I will ask them to share their considerable expertise with us, and then we'll have time for engagement uh, with all of you here uh, in the audience. Um, so I will first introduce uh, Leah Johnson. And um, I, we're, we're a little out of order. Um, we, we had, as I'll mention, one of our panelists unfortunately couldn't um, make it. Um, so I'm going to introduce them. Um, uh, in a particular order, but we're going to start in terms of speaking in, um, uh, in a different order. So, Leah Johnson is University of Florida Research Foundation Professor and Professor of Law and Associate Director of the Race and Crime Center for Justice at the University of Florida. Um, she's a leading expert in the areas of mental health and criminal law procedure, and she's a productive scholar. In fact, her work has uh, appear in virtually every law review in the country. I saw that list and I'm not going to um, go through it because it is quite impressive and, and comprehensive. Um, she also publishes in top peer review um, interdisciplinary journals, including behavioral sciences and the law, among others. Her work has been widely cited by legal scholars and peers and treatises in criminal law and constitutional law and criminal procedure. Her work has also received attention from courts and social scientists, and her theory of sentencing forms part of the theoretical framework for the standard textbook for forensic psychiatric fellowship programs. She was elected into the American Law Institute recently and has served as chair of both the criminal justice section and the law and mental disability section of the American Association of Law Schools. She's also served on the Legal Scholars Committee of the American Psychology Law Society she earned her undergraduate degree from Princeton and her law degree from Harvard Law School and previously worked here in D.C. at Arnold and Porter as an associate and also as director of the Maryland Public Interest Research Group in Baltimore and clerk for Judge Tallman um, on the Ninth Circuit. Uh, to her right, uh, we have Daniela Gilbert, who is director of Redefining Public Safety at the Vera Institute of Justice. Uh, and Daniela has spent over a decade working on community safety and policing transformation. She was previously the Director of Justice Initiatives in the New York City Mayor's Office of Community uh, Mental Health, formerly Thrive NYC, 
and she implemented programs and policy to increase access to behavioral health care. She also worked on collaborative gun violence reduction and crime survivor assistance at the NYPD. She developed trainings for law enforcement on how to build the public's trust, and in 2015 received the Certificate of Recognition from the Vice President um, uh, Kamala Harris uh, for her important work. Uh, in 2011, she co-founded the California Partnership for Safe Communities and partnered with community, civic, and criminal justice leaders on community-driven and evidence-based gun violence and incarceration reduction strategies in 10 cities across California. She earned her MPA from NYU's Wagner School of Public Service and her BA in Sociology with a citation in Spanish language from Harvard College, which will um, reign supreme over Yale tomorrow at the <laughs> REO game. Uh, All right. So uh, next we have Ira Burnham, who is a graduate of Harvard Law School and who joined the Judge David L. Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law Legal Staff in 1988 and became its legal director in 1989. Formerly, I served as legal director of the Children's Defense Fund and senior attorney at the Southern Poverty Law Center and a law clerk to the Honorable Frank M. Johnson, the legendary um, uh, uh, Judge Johnson. Uh, he's recognized for his expertise in policy and legal issues related to the ADA, uh, community mental health care, Medicaid, and children's issues. He uh, often consults with federal agencies and state policymakers and advocates and has served on the board of the American Civil Liberties Union of Maryland, Disability Rights Maryland, and the Disability Rights Bar Association, and has been a member of the ABA Commission on Mental and Physical Disability Law. He's currently on the board of the National Coalition for Child Protection Reform, and on missions with Mental Disability Rights International, he's helped to investigate human rights abuses in psychiatric facilities, and also provide training and technical assistance to advocates and policymakers in Hungary, the Czech Republic, Albania, Romania, Ukraine, and Japan. Um, as I mentioned, our fourth panelist, um, uh, due to illness, Frank Schraub, uh, is unable to uh, join us, but he is the director of the Center for Targeted Violence Prevention at the National Policing uh, Institute. And um, uh, stepping in for uh, Frank is our wonderful uh, greeter and moderator, um, uh, Chief Gino Hawkins of the Fayetteville, North Carolina Police Department. We look forward to hearing much more about uh, Chief Hawkins' um, important work um, uh, uh, as we move uh, forward in our uh, panel. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our wonderful panelists. All right, and I'm going to start with Chief Hawkins. And, um, uh, Chief, again, I know that you've been, um, you know, quite active um, in this area, and so it would be um, interesting to, to hear about your work. Certainly, we know that you uh, you co-chair the ABA Law Enforcement uh, Committee, but you have a day job leading the police force in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, so we'd love to hear your perspective um, on these topics. Absolutely. Thank you. First, uh, so as I mentioned before, um, I've been doing this just close to about 34 years. And we've had to evolve in law enforcement. We had no choice. And what the uh, previous Attorney General mentioned, we had to become smarter and really look at um, what we're doing and why we're doing it. One of the reasons why I'm able to talk just a little bit about this topic is uh, creating the mental health liaison position in my, in my department, in my community, was, was out of the need for how often we were responding to continue calls for service dealing with mental health. And on average, just itemizing three times a day minimum of a known mental health call is going out. So now um, being able to be aware of what are the optional response, responses that we can provide that um, exist. So my team has done a little bit of research and there is a, uh, looking up through crisis intervention and um, national to see what do they recommend for law enforcement, what do they recommend to address these issues nationally. There are many models that exist nationally in different communities. Um, so picking the right one for your community is crucial. There is a mobile crisis team, and these are services that are available for crisis intervention related to mental health, substance abuse, and developmental disabilities. 
What you can expect from a mobile crisis team is the initial support and triage via telephone and or a mobile crisis team visiting if necessary. Triage can also happen when they call into 911, where they establish someone who's a clinician inside the 911 system, um, embedded so they can transfer the call to try to make sure what type of response is needed. They also can do an assessment of the presenting crisis, current support soap and resources. They are a short-term crisis management until the crisis is resolved. They provide also referrals for appropriate follow-up services, um, support, supportive collaborative crisis planning for solutions focused outcomes. They can also be consulted in advocacy with existing support and services. Then we have mental health response model variations that exist in different communities. Um, this can also uh, show itself as law enforcement calls for after action event support. That's kind of like what my liaison does. And this is where officers call or refer behavioral specialists after encountering someone in need of, of services or assistance. Law enforcement calls for non-clinical support. Um, this is dispatch trained civilians instead of clinicians, such as behavioral health volunteers, crisis workers, and qualified professionals. Peer support workers join law enforcement. This is individuals with lived experiences of mental illness, substance use disorders, and or justice involvement training or certified to, to provide services and then clinical staff, staff devised from dispatch centers, as I mentioned before. There are integrated behavioral health counselors and or clinicians in call centers to provide early crisis resolutions and diversion. Every community in North Carolina, not every, there are many communities in North Carolina that are adopting certain um, elements of it. It really is gonna depend on what the leaders in that community provide for existing services that is supported, funded by the state. And it's also going to depend on what the community really has to acknowledge, whether it is how to immediately get support to the community, and like in a dispatch center triaging that, or if you want to expand funding to have either a co-responder model, whether they respond and provide resources for that. But it's really going to involve the entire community stepping up and acknowledging first that there's an issue and then um, also resolving that everyone plays a role from the hospitals to, uh, to law enforcement. And I'm also, ask, also acknowledging most of those response teams are not going in the elements when there is a weapon involved or when there's a clear danger. And you're gonna have to have some element of law enforcement engaged, trained, and, and understanding what's the next step. So uh, I'm sure there's many other models that exist, but those are the ones that we're Thank you, Chief. Um, and I want to now uh, turn to Professor Johnston. And um, uh, you know, again, you have um, sort of deep experience around empirical research and uh, structural racism and policing and you know, treatment refusal of these issues. And we'd love to, to hear your opening perspective about that. Thanks so much, Dean. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here today and appreciate the invitation. Last time I was here, um, I think at this conference was maybe two or three years ago. Where I was talking. Um, on mental health courts, and I'm excited to speak on this topic as well. So my comments um, will address the lethality of policing, and, of policing people in psychiatric crisis, how black individuals in crisis are particularly vulnerable to lethal police response, empirical research related to some of the models uh, that Gina mentioned, and what can be done when treatment is received, is refused by people in crisis. So compared to those without mental illness, people with psychiatric concerns are three times more likely to have interactions with police officers and are more likely to be arrested and charged with an offense. The severity of excessive use of force toward people with a mental disorder has been well documented. Overall, 25% of victims of police shootings have been found to display evidence of mental instability. And research suggests that individuals with mental illness are seven to 16 times more likely to be killed by police officers compared to those without. People of color with mental health issues are particularly vulnerable because they may be particularly likely to experience crisis. Rates of mental disorder for black and Latino populations are nearly the same as those for white populations, but blacks and Latinos experience a 
disproportionately higher burden of disability as compared to whites. Among people with any mental disorder, 48% of whites receive mental health services compared to only 31% of blacks and Latinos. And when they do access services, communities of color often receive poor quality of care. Part of this is due to the structural racism that has long been inherent in psychiatric medicine. Since the creation of the Professional Association in 1840, psychiatry has long pathologized African Americans. Psychiatrists have made the claim in the decades after Reconstruction that black Americans were unfit for the challenges of life as independent, fully enfranchised citizens. They hypothesized that the racial disharmony at the height of the Civil Rights Movement manifested in psychotic behaviors afflicting the black lower class. And in the 1970s, they marketed the antipsychotic medication Haldol as a way to control assaultive and belligerent black men. In addition, the vast majority of psychiatrists are white. They are in private practice and don't take Medicaid patients. There's a lack of attunement uh, to black expressions of emotions that is frequently conflated. Um, they frequently conflate distress with anger. This led both to an over-reliance upon the diagnosis of psychosis and to an under-diagnosis of major depression, particularly in black men. With many people of color not able to access consistent and regular mental health services, they are more likely to experience a mental health emergency, thus triggering a law enforcement response that criminalizes mental illness and may be victimizing. Indeed, police response appears to be particularly deadly for black individuals in mental health crisis. Regardless of mental illness, black Americans are 2.6 times more likely to be killed during interactions with police than are white individuals. And when black individuals have a mental illness, their relative risk of death increases more than fourfold. Black individuals who are mentally ill have the highest death rate in police interactions compared to other racial or ethnic groups with mental illness. So this all calls for a reorientation in traditional mental health crisis response. Using law enforcement in crisis response creates a structural risk environment for people with mental disorder that increases their risk for death, injury, arrest, and traumatization. Given that worst outcomes are associated with black individuals experiencing mental health crisis, it's my argument that we should center the black experience and likelihood of trauma and injury when deciding between models of crisis intervention. Recently, a group of black psychiatrists in the New England Journal of Medicine called for clinician-led crisis response teams and assigning the responsibility to clinical teams aligned with standards set by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The call for civilian-led response also coheres with research on effectiveness of crisis response models. So research suggests that CIT training for officers, while widespread, um, is actually not very effective. So a 2016 review of eight studies on the effects of CIT training showed that CIT training had no significant effect on the likelihood of officers to use force or on the likelihood an officer would arrest a person with mental disorder. A second 2021 review of research by the International Association of Chiefs of Police reached a similar conclusion. Co-response models with police officers, often CIT trained, and other first responders are partnered with a mental health clinician to respond to mental health emergencies are more promising. One of the most well-known co-response models is called PLEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. It's now operating in 21 states. It started in Seattle in 2011. PLEAD has been proven to reduce participant involvement in the criminal justice system. So one 2019 study out of Seattle found that lead participants had 1.4 fewer jail bookings per year than members of a non-lead control group and spent 41 fewer days <coughs> in jail per year after entering the program than before entering lead. Also faced fewer felony cases per year on average after entering the program and had 88% lower odds of prison incarceration relative to comparison participants. These findings were largely replicated in San Francisco, and LEAD has also been demonstrated to improve participant access to housing, 
and increase employment opportunities. Um, one note about how this works, uh, the model lead program involves three steps. So after arrest, suspects can choose whether to divert to lead instead of entering the criminal justice system. Participants are then given a case manager who can connect them to social services, and the case manager then works with the prosecutor's office to hopefully reduce uh, legal system involvement and promote the participant's well-being. Much less research has been done on mental health-led models that don't typically involve law enforcement. The research that does exist, however, suggests favorable outcomes. So research has been done, for instance, on what's called the CAHOOTS model, crisis assistance helping out on the streets, uh, which developed in Eugene, Springfield, Oregon. Um, pilot programs now exist in Pittsburgh, New York City, San Francisco, and other US cities. The CAHOOTS program has been successful at preventing violence, sorry, preventing police from responding to a certain subset of crises that are more appropriately handled by clinicians. These, as Gina noted, do not involve violence. And actually, any call that, that comes in that involves a threat of violence or a weapon does not go to one of these teams. Um, but a recent study compiled by the Eugene Police Crime Analysis Unit found that in 2019, who teams responded to nearly 24,000 calls, which was about 17% of 911 dispatch calls. The Hoots was estimated to divert between 3 and 8% of calls from service away from a police response altogether. And when a Hoots team responded to a call for service without police backup, only 2% of instances did that team later call for backup from traditional police. Um, annually, it saves Oregon taxpayers an average of $8.5 million in police and emergency department expenditures each year. Even less is known about mobile response teams, which are activated through a non-911 cop number and don't involve police. Studies that do exist show that the use of mobile response teams can reduce hospitalization for people experiencing a behavioral health crisis and more successfully connect individuals with community-based mental health services after a crisis. But current crisis response models need to be more sensitive to the realities of mental disorder. So a survey of higher performing mobile crisis teams shows that in around 70% of encounters, the mobile team is able to diffuse the crisis at the scene. But in 30% of encounters, the individual requires connection to facility-based care. A significant percentage of those individuals, though, may refuse treatment. A common symptom of, se of severe mental illness is anosognosia, or lack of insight into one's illness and need for treatment. Some research has, researchers estimate that 40% of individuals with bipolar disorder and 50 to 90% of individuals with schizophrenia have anosognosia. And if a person refuses treatment or transport to a treatment or stabilization facility, the law requires that the mobile crisis team member release the person upon their discharge demand. One possible partial, partial solution would be the adoption of legislation permitting the formation of what's called Ulysses Arrangements. It's a mental health uh, advanced directive that would empower the person to obtain treatment during an acute mental health episode because the person has learned that episodes can cause treatment refusals. Nebraska passed legislation in 2020 authorizing this kind of arrangement. So with the Ulysses arrangement, the person enters the arrangement when she has capacity, and the arrangement authorizes doctors to treat the person during a future episode when the person lacks capacity to consent to treatment, even if the episode causes treatment refusals and the person doesn't meet involuntary treatment criteria. These agreements should also include provisions for involuntary transport to a treatment uh, center. There should also be a mechanism for individuals with behavioral health needs to enter information into a database and for first responders to be able to, to search that database for information that could be useful during a crisis response. The database could receive or could include information regarding diagnosis and history, especially if there's been no history of violence that could calm the situation, protecting everyone's safety. Um, also, people could enter information about typical symptoms, chosen facility to receive treatment and contact information of a healthcare agent or family member. With this information, first responders would be 
better able to understand the person's behaviors when they arrive, protecting everyone's safety. In 2020, Virginia created a database like this, the Marcus Alert System, in which anyone can upload information to be available to first responders who respond to emergency calls. So in summary, mental health is a public health issue that should be dealt with in that manner. When considering mental health crisis response options, we should center the experience of African Americans who are disproportionately likely to experience distress when having a psychiatric condition and disproportionately likely to experience lethal force. Um, empirical evidence suggests that CIT training is actually not effective at reducing officers' use of force or likelihood of arrest, but greater effectiveness can be found in co-responder models, and we should keep in mind the realities of mental disorder and possibility of treatment that result from moving forward. Thank you, Dean. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we will now move to Danielle. Thank you so much. Um, I feel very validated in the decisions we made about uh, speaker sequence. Uh, <laughs> that was really, really helpful. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to be speaking about the possibilities for unarmed civilian crisis responders, um, given all the um, disheartening but accurate information that the professor just shared, and also speak about um, opportunities to approach implementation of civilian crisis response through a lens of anti-racism and with efforts around equity so as not to replicate a lot of the harms um, previously mentioned as we develop a new and alternative to police crisis response. Um, and um, just echoing something that you shared, so the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, states that it's unacceptable and unsafe for police to serve as de facto mental health mobile crisis system. Uh, for policing to serve as the de facto mental health mobile crisis system, and that the mere presence of police vehicles and armed officers during these calls can often escalate the situation. And um, it, uh, it's an honor and unusual for me to get to sit next to a chief when, when sharing this information and, um, and hearing you talk about uh, your leadership and work in North Carolina um, makes me want to elevate that um, you know, the, the status quo of response is an example of structural violence and state violence and police in these positions are, um, I think, largely, very largely, unwill uh, uh, not unwilling because they respond to their calls for service and you know do their work um, based on uh, you know public calls. But um, these aren't positions that police want to be in. There's a there's broad based recognition that this is not the appropriate role for police, both among people who uh, experience um, mental and behavioral health crises. Um, their loved ones and uh, law enforcement themselves. And so um, in the context of that, it was really important for my team at Vera to better understand the, uh, the landscape of these programs as they're um, you know, exponentially increasing and how to do that in a way that centers equity. So uh, uh, we mentioned the CAHOOTS model. Um, before 2020, there were basically two of these uh, civilian crisis response programs, two or three civilian crisis response programs that were connected to 911. And um, since June 2020, recently, really, there have been uh, you know more than two dozen places that are either piloting or implementing these kinds of responses. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Ann Larson, who you'll be hearing from this afternoon, um, who was uh, a leader in Olympia, Washington, one of the pioneering places implementing these responses. Um, so my team did a, um, a nine-city analysis that um, looked at 911 calls for service to better understand the proportion of calls that these teams could um, could practically respond to and sort of take, take off the plate of law enforcement. And um, what we did was we looked both at the, um, the 911 call types that are currently uh, categorized or labeled as directly related to mental health um, by 911 call takers, but also a category of calls that um, programs like Cahoots and um, Denver Star, for example, are responding to that may not uh, be explicitly labeled as mental health calls by 911 call takers, but very clearly based on the circumstance have uh, an underlying behavioral health need or are clearly not related to um, a violent crime. And so looking at these cities, we found that an average of 19% of calls for service could be responded to by these teams. 
Um, but you know, of course, that requires uh, a, a, you know system change and training in the context of 911 dispatching. Um, so, with that in mind, and recognizing a pretty significant proportion of calls that could be um, taken off the plates of police officers, we um, we interviewed. Um, I want to make sure I got this right. We interviewed uh, 35 folk. Uh, we did 35 interviews with um, over 40, with 44, per, 40, sorry, with 44 subject matter experts, and um, that included stakeholders with lived experience and with professional experience um, related to behavioral health crises. And so we identified seven different areas where places could attend to um, and uh, implement. Um, implement more equitable approaches to program planning, uh, operations, and evaluation. So um, in the context of program planning and community collaboration, it was very clear that, um, that the importance of partnering and collaborating with people with lived experience in the development and design of these programs and how they respond, and uh, the importance of allocating time and uh, resources to integrate that feedback before designing a response. And so I was, um, when I was working in the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health, uh, there was this you know, Im imperative around uh, launching um, a health first crisis response as the mayoral administration was ending. And uh, the, the choices around the program design in some ways were at odds with the, um, with the desires and advocacy communities' uh, recommendations around what that ought to look like, and so, uh, you know, given the opportunity to launch a different type of response, it's really critical to design it in a way that's responsive to community desires. Um, the next part, which I mentioned um, already, navigating 911 triage and culture change. So, um, in addition to uh, refining the assessments of um, what kinds of calls can be responded to, also refining assessments of safety and violence. So, you know, not using zip codes as a proxy for requiring police to respond, for example. Um, embedding uh, experts in, embedding behavioral health experts in 911 call centers is really important to help uh, with the training and support of operators. And also recognizing that, you know, there are a lot of people who are not comfortable calling 911 and, um, the chief mentioned uh, and professor mentioned that uh, mobile crisis teams are are not typically linked to 911 and the timeline for uh, responses from mobile crisis teams in many places at best is about two hours so um, so ensuring that um, that there are additional access points beyond 911 is something that a lot of communities have done whether it's through 311 whether it's through the new 98 number um, or uh, a different 10-digit um, number that is also routed to, to the dispatch center. Um, staffing is also a really important opportunity for centering equity, so recruiting responders who reflect the communities that they serve, trying to um, mitigate some of the differences in the profession that the professor mentioned, and also really prioritizing skills and experience over clinical degrees, not that clinical degrees aren't important, but in the context of um, crisis response and de-escalation, they may not be um, may not be as necessary if the priority is um, recruiting responders to reflect the communities that they serve. Uh, integrating peers, people with lived experience of behavioral health crises into their response is very important, and um, conducting trainings that allow for multi multidisciplinary teams to better understand each other's roles and functions is one way to enhance coordination on, uh, on the ground when responding to calls as well. Um, uh, pay equity and program governance are also areas where it's important to attend to equity and also I think for the sustainability of this work. So um, providing responders with competitive pay, there's clearly a lot of opportunity to save cities money by um, reducing the number of calls that police respond to. At the same time, it's very important to compensate people in these positions in a way that will uh, mitigate the turnover um, that we often see in 911 call centers, for example. Um, 
also um, structuring the program governance to be able to promote adaptability and be responsive to the experiences of people who are the, um, you know, the, the recipients of this service. So given that this is new, given that um, the whole idea is to create better outcomes for people who are experiencing crises, to be able to develop a program that can uh, first access their feedback and then also integrate it is critical. And then um, related to that, you know, using data to guide implementation, so tracking key performance metrics to evaluate for equity, um, that would require collecting demographic information, which many, um, many public services aren't always equipped to collect, um, collecting feedback, like I mentioned, and then regularly sharing data out um, with the community so that folks can, um, can, folks can understand that moving away from policing as a response is um, both effective and safe for everyone involved. Um, there's uh, an opportunity as well to learn from grassroots responses that are not connected to, um, to government systems. And um, they acknowledge and address distrust in, of call centers and of system responses in a way that I think is important for folks who are uh, changing public systems because um, there may be ways to actually integrate the practices of folks, not co-opt, but integrate the practices of folks who are not part of the system into the way that um, the way that responses and decisions real time are, um, are made. And then finally, um, creating ongoing oversight opportunities for, um, for accountability to the communities that, um, that rely on these services and attending to ongoing community advocacy rather than viewing community engagement as an event. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and we will uh, now move to Ira. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try mostly to kind of respond to and, and build on, I think, a lot of the, the wonderful information and experience that's been uh, communicated on the panel. Um, there are a couple of things I wanna say at the beginning, um, and just touch on it. Hopefully we're gonna have some substantial time for conversation among the panelists and, and with you all. Um, one is I, I wanna kind of, um, I guess, second um, Danielle's point about the importance of input uh, from people with lived experience and how much can be learned. And I know in, in New York and elsewhere, um, there were some, there's been some wonderful innovation by peers, organizations, some important work done. A lot of the innovation in the field of crisis services is actually coming from um, peer developed or heavily peer influenced um, services. And so uh, I think that, that and it's consistent, I think, as well with um, what the chief said about kind of needing a broad cross-section of people to get them together on the same page to really be able to make progress in this field. Um, because, I mean, just stepping back as someone who's been around for a long time, it's not a new problem. You know, the people in mental illness are disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system, particularly in jails. I mean, less so in prison, but there are really high proportion of people in jails across the country, you know, several multiples of the proportion of the population, um, and, you know, and no reflection of their um, propensity for criminal behavior, which is about the same as the rest of the population. So, you know, people have known about this for decades, and there's been discussion about it for decades. And the fact that we've made, I mean, I think we're making a lot more progress today in the recent years than we have in a long while one sort of has to ask the question, what is it structurally in our society that is preventing you know, progress on uh, you know, a, a matter that is so widely known? If you ask people on the street you know, about people with mental illness, like the one thing they know is there's too many people with mental illness in jail. You know? And um, if uh, people are obviously concerned about over-policing, over-incarceration, um, police, you know, fatalities at the hands of the police, they probably don't know the people with mental illness, you know, disproportionately experience all that. But it, you know, it's, a, it's an issue that, that is of, of, of national attention. And I, I don't have any answer for why we've made so little progress. I think part of it is the, that we're dealing with two very different systems. You know, there's a law enforcement system, there's a mental health and substance abuse service system. Um, and 
and it's not simply, you know, and, and I think, you know, there's an interesting dynamic, which if it's true, I think it is, that a very high proportion of police calls um, are for, you know, responding to people about moments, you have trespass, you tend to have disorderly conduct, you have a lot of kind of welfare checks. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I learned from getting involved in a, in a Supreme Court case, um, I had looked at the statistics, it was a, a woman who was killed by the police, well, she wasn't killed, she was shot several times and wasn't killed, by the police who were coming to implement an involuntary treatment order. So it turns out police, tens of thousands of them across the country. Why the police are doing that, I don't know. Um, but you know, if you posit that there's a very high proportion of um, you know, police activity that really we could replace with either mental health, you know, mental health providers or with you know, unarmed civilians, um, that sort of suggests you know, where the resources come from. Well, that would reduce the police activity a lot. And you know, I hear jailers say all the time, yeah, whatever, 20% of the people in this jail shouldn't be here. They're only here for mental health reasons and they're here because we don't have other resources. You hear that a lot. Well, if you actually shifted responsibility for those individuals um, to the mental health system, which would require them actually taking responsibility as opposed to you know, saying, oh, no, we don't want to serve these people and the police becomes involved. Yeah, you know, there is the issue of kind of what, who's, where does the money come from? And they tend to be relatively expensive people, people who refuse treatment or are repeatedly arrested or repeatedly shut in emergency rooms. You know, they're, they're fairly expensive, especially at the beginning. And you know, what experience we have in this country of resources being shifted from the criminal justice system to a service system in order to fund this alternative response. And the difficulty of actually finding, you know, investing in the mental health system, which is very under-resourced, but you know, a, I think a political, an inability of political systems to disinvest in the police. I, mean, I think communities are now very interested in these alternative responses, but can't quite answer the question where the resources can come from. And if they don't come from the police or from the criminal justice system, as the people, you know, as the clients come, then someone's going to come up with the money. Fortunately, that's a little bit easier in the present context because we've got all the new federal money and the economy's improving. But you know, for many years, that was a very challenging question. So this may actually be a moment of opportunity because of all the new federal funds and um, some, some medi new Medicaid options and uh, kind of increased attention. So we'll sort of see. I mean, still this population, you know, is not among the most admired and valued in our country. So they may not, you know, see the benefit of the new resources that are coming to state governments, both because the economy is improving and because of the federal government. So, a little bit of, I mean, I don't know if that's a downer or a reality check, but I think as people have demonstrated, you know, we are, it's not that we know what to do, but we have a lot of good and effective approaches that, you know, we, that we need to expand and learn from um, and do a better job. And I hope we see that in the future. So, let me, I'll say that. The other, the other thing um, I want to just mention is sort of, I think um, there is a tendency uh, when looking at the most challenging folks in this population who are repeatedly arrested, repeatedly jailed. They also tend to be repeatedly shut in emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, it's, it, they're really, we're spending a lot of money on them. So it's interesting, you know, that we can't figure out a way to kind of spend the money differently. And some communities have actually managed to do that and invest in housing and services and reduce that population. There's a lot of efforts around the country. I mean, they're relatively small, but they're pretty effective. Um, and, uh, you know, they tend to pay for themselves. But, yeah, you know, those, those efforts are, have all been based on voluntary services. And, you know, it is kind of a precept of the mental health system that in order to help someone, you have to build a relationship with them. And, you know, there are many, many people, I think, who fit this category, especially in the population we're talking about, who, you know, you can say they're refusing, you can say they're resistant services, you can say they've had pretty bad experiences with the system, they just don't want to be a part of it anymore. And, you know, a lot of them are on the streets, a lot of them are doing um, alcohol and drugs, 
But you know, it turns out, and I'm not going to go into all the, the details, but you know, some of this information is available from the center. Um, on you know, sort of, we had a, one publication, the version to what you know, goes through the evidence of some of these effective services. Um, but th this is also, you know, this is a problem that the mental health system faces itself, right? This is not just a criminal justice question, because they're interested in improving a lot of people with mental illness. And so it turns out that having, you know, teams of people who don't sit in their office um, and go and engage these individuals, particularly leading with peers, has been a highly effective approach. I mean, it's called ACT around most of the country. Um, California has kind of repackaged it a little bit, but the success rates um, for ACT teams, or even, you know, I was at a presentation in Harris County um, where they, they actually do something like this through the sheriff's office. I mean, it's not ideal. I don't think you really want the criminal justice system to be leading these efforts, but, you know, they have a case manager, a clinician, a peer, they, you know, they have a very high success rate in sort of engaging people who are unengaged in treatment and kind of stay, help bringing them back into the system. I mean, the trick, of course, is showing we have something to offer you. And, um, and that generally has to be something other than confinement in a facility. And if, you know, for folks who are homeless, housing helps. And, um, and housing that's not you know, full of conditions and rules. So you know, people with mental illness, you know, I mean, as, as sometimes folks say, you know, we may be crazy, but we're not stupid. You know? And um, you've offered people a good deal which is someone who's coming out to truly help them build a relationship and has some concrete things to offer them. Because often how this works is you, you ask the person how you can help them. You don't say, you really need treatment. You know? um, and, and kind of work from there, and it can be weeks, months before you build a relationship. And the reason I want to sort of talk about voluntary services is because there is a lot of discussion of um, coercion. Uh, as a solution, I think maybe a quick fix to this population. I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that it works. Um, but you know, given the given sort of the framing that some of the panelists have given about you know the sort of concerns for equity and uh, in, in, in the system, I don't think you want to replace the criminal justice system of too much convert, you know coercion and too much involuntary confinement. But a mental health system that basically has the same characteristics, too much co you know, coercion and too much involuntary confinement. And there's a lot of evidence that, you know, that involuntary treatment in the mental health system is disproportionately you know, used um, when it comes to people of color. Um, and so if you look at outpatient commitment data in, say, New York, you know, there's, a, it's, there's a huge disproportion of um, involuntary treatment orders issued against people of color. Um, so, you yeah, know, that's one caution that I want to um, issue. Uh, you know, a lot of the elements, it's interesting, a lot of the elements that people have spoken about today are, you know, are echoes from the mental health system. Because, because what I want to present is sort of the mental health system perspective on how you serve these folks and, and how you would begin to address this. Because um, I think if you look at the research or the activities that are kind of criminal, criminal justice system based, you mix, you miss not only, you know, you miss not only a lot, but you miss most of what's going on in the country. Um, because those mental health system efforts, they aren't necessarily directed at people who have justice involved, or, you know, they're supposed to include those people. And I do think that there's a tendency that the whole system has for sometimes washing their hands of those folks. Um, and so they, by default, become the responsibility of the criminal justice system. But in, in the last, I don't know, five years in particular, there's been a lot of activity um, describing, building, and researching what a crisis, you know, what, what an adequate or appropriate crisis system looks like. And so uh, I just want to go through a little bit of it. But, you know, it's, the elements that have been largely described today, uh, maybe with a little bit of a, twitch, a twist. So one is obviously you need a place that, you know, it's, it's something like a 911 for mental health. And one way to do that is to, you know, to incorporate the mental health response capacity, the deployment of the mental health response capacity into 911. Some places have done it, Harris County, for example. Um, 
or you know, technologically you can, you know, someone, you know, some step, I read, I forget the system, but you know, you call 911, they say, are you calling about the fire? They were calling about fire, police, ambulance, or mental health services. And you immediately get connected to, based on your answer. I mean, some places also they do a little screening. You know, if someone, a, a lot of calls, again, are about trespass, they're about disorderly conduct, or about someone who's acting weird or where they shouldn't be, or being, you know, they're in a public park, they're in the downtown business section, they're, they're a problem. And um, for the community, or because of their behavior, or both. And so a little, you know, screening helps. And, and yes, if the, if the 911 has collected data, um, based on past calls, and in some cases self-disclosure, another way to get at some of these issues that you that are raised by the Ulysses Clause is, you know, you can ask people who are repeatedly, yeah, in crisis, you know, whether they want to share information with uh, um, crisis services, or their families can share information. There, there's no law against you know, individuals or their families sharing information in crisis with 911. Nine, most 911 don't have the technology for capturing and using. You know, that that's being developed, I think, in part. You have this new 988 number, which is supposed to be the mental health crisis number. You know, there's kind of a vision. You know, it, I don't think anyone's worked out exactly how that's going to interact with 911, but you know, the, we've, we've described some of the options. And obviously, there are technological solutions. This is not, you know, this is something that a tech company can figure out. And there's some substantial money from the feds now to. Um, to promote those solutions. So, you know, the first is, who do you call? And then when you call, what do you get? Um, so you need some open door, but as people said, you also need some open capacity. And um, we basically have kind of two, two different um, teams that are being deployed, and you know, sometimes the distinctions are not so clear between them, but you know, one model is this sort of cahoots type model, which is basically, it's not heavily medical, it's not heavily mental health, you know, maybe an EMT and a social worker, an EMT or a helping type person. You know, they're not going to provide mental health treatment, but they can maybe allay the crisis and, and help the person get the services they need. You know, then there's the psychiatric mobile crisis teams, and um, there's, I mean, I think the one the, in the mental health system, there are a lot of these. This has been, you know, they're far far fewer than needed. But this has been a service model that's existed for you know, a couple of decades, I think. And it's now actually funded, you know, you get enhanced funding for, there's a new Medicaid option, you get enhanced Medicaid funding for psychiatric mobile crisis teams. And, um, and they do operate differently. So you have one model where they're delaying the crisis, moving on, they're referring the person. Yeah, that may not work with a lot of the folks that we've just discussed, because you refer the person and they don't go. So, um, so I think you know some of the models are they can continue to treat for a period of time. They can actually do mental health. You know, they have someone either on the team, say a registered nurse, or, or um, you know a psychiatric backup. Um, uh, they can work with a registered nurse on the team, but they they can provide treatment and they can do it on a continuing basis for several days. And then you know again, a lot of these people you don't want to refer them. You want someone up the ball and kind of start trying to build a relationship with them if that um, has, you know, if there isn't already someone responsible for doing that, a peer, a case manager, an ad team. Um, so you've got those two approaches. I think the one thing that we haven't mentioned is you also, I think the data you mentioned is 18, 30 percent of the cases, people kind of needed a place to go. And, you know, that doesn't, in most cases, that doesn't have to be a hospital. In most cases, it's sort of, it shouldn't be a hospital. It's, too, it's not what the person needs. It's too expensive. Plus, they're pretty crowded, in part because all these people are going there and don't need to. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think, where a lot of the interesting innovation has occurred. Anywhere from peer run respite homes, you know, and to more, you know, sort of more medically staffed crisis departments. Still, you know, it's, it's a great way to get access to. You know, for a, you know, a place to stay for people who need it for a short period of time because of a, because of a crisis, either they need to stabilize their mental health situation or because of what just happened, they can't really go back to where they were for some period of time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so these apartments, you know, you can have peer staff, you can have paraprofessional staff, you can have mental health staff on call. Um, and those can be, you know, you can rent them. Those can be scattered all through the communities and make them very accessible. And, you know, in some communities, especially the peer-led ones, people just refer themselves in other communities. You know, they can be referred there or bought there by, um, by a crisis team or a cahoots team. Um, and our, actually, if I can jump in, yeah. uh, we only have five minutes. Right. Right. Yeah. I've got so much wonderful content. And this is where, you know, having been a law professor for much of my career, it comes in handy. So I'm going to flip the script a little bit. And what I'm going to do is do a lightning round. So I, I know there may be questions out there. So if everyone who has a question can ask it, and then I'm going to go down the line and have each panelist respond to what bits and pieces make sense given um, uh, that we're running out of time. So uh, please let me know if you have questions and we'll get along right here. I have one to start as you think about it, um, and then I'll come here. And this is um, directed at uh, Chief Hawkins. I saw you writing furiously the entire panel, and I'm interested in how law enforcement executives, um, when they see things or hear about things happening in other jurisdictions, how you evaluate whether it might be something you'd adopt in your own jurisdiction. Yes, we have a question here as well. I wanted to take a look at the globes. 
right, so all right, we're just going to get straight, right? <laughs> so we're going to start with the chief and come down the line. Justin, are we, are, you know, if we go over a minute, we're not going to get, okay, all right. So, uh, yes. Can you repeat your real quick? Repeat yours real quick. I'm sorry. Can you repeat your question? Oh, just how, how uh, law enforcement executives, police chiefs evaluate things that are working well in other jurisdictions to see if they're going to adopt them. So absolutely, um, the, the expectation should be you should always be reevaluating what you're doing, and you don't have to be the one making the mistakes yourself. We, we look at, if you're um, a leader, you should be looking at best practices, best policies nationally all the time, especially because we're facing the same issues all the time. And I'm always actively researching, going to do that um, in order to figure out we can't keep doing the same thing. Um, as much as I want to measure decreasing crime as a measurement of our safety in our community, that is not the measure. You know, joining in on what um, Daniela said with establishing community public safety programs can, can cover a lot of different things, right? That's not connected to the government, but is also engaging the public, the citizens, the hospitals. Um, looking at also going to um, tag a little bit, the funding. When funding got taken away from mental health facilities, it did not get redirected to police departments. We could ask those questions. Where did that funding go years ago when they shut down hospitals? And what happened that people turned their eyes away from? Um, what happened that they went to prisons and now they're being serviced with funding? What is it, Medicaid? These are things that we're learning about right now. When I established the, um, the liaison, I also established a homeless coordinator, um, this non-civilian. I had to take money away, and I had to take it and make a officer position less in my, on my staff. Two different less positions on my staff, because I felt that that position can help me collect the data, get an understanding, make it dedicated to doing these services to help the police department. So, and as we reevaluate, we we're starting to realize some of this is being funded in other jurisdictions by Medicaid. Um, so there is funding out there for the hospitals, making the hospitals aware that, hey, we have a problem when you keep releasing this individual that you say is getting services, we're picking back up and bringing them back to you. What's going on with that? Just asking those questions that we can't ask as law enforcement, someone else is going to have to present that because they're not going to listen to us. We're not medical professionals, medical professionals, so we didn't sign up to do that. But we've had to learn and get training on, on a, lot of, a lot of those things. So, um, we're open. If it's going to help the community be safe, we're absolutely open. And I operate as a community citizen all the time. I want to know if me or my family have a crisis that's mental health related, and we're, we're you know, the complexity is possible. I don't want someone showing up with a gun in the next year. That's how I operate mm -hmm. as in my community, and I would want them to be safe. And um, these are all questions that we shouldn't be answering as the law enforcement professional. We should have the community members knowing that we are in it, we're committed. There are many scenes that my, my department responds to that have absolutely successful incidents, but they don't, no one knows about those incidences. They only know about the one bad incident. So. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with a question about cross-disability. I think um, there are a, a ton of salient examples. There are some related to people who are deaf or hard of hearing, but I think the point that you make really reemphasizes the importance of planning and design that includes people who are most likely to um, interact with law enforcement in these contexts as a way to actually design and inform strategies, not so we're only accounting for race equity, but all kinds of inequities that people experience. Um, I think the point that you made about uh, how officers are trained to respond to people who have a weapon and what's defined as a weapon is really uh, problematic and what we know about the inefficacy of CIT training when it's, um, you know, the, the standard for law enforcement training, I think, um, also uh, demonstrates that there really needs to be a wholesale revisitation of how officers are trained and for why and to what end and who in the community is involved in designing that training or delivering that training. And one of the challenges around that is that we, you know, we have 17,000 law enforcement agencies in the country and a lack of um, national standards and cohesion around that. So it means that it, it goes to professional associations and I think the idea of partnering um, across the uh, 
health care system or mental health care system and law enforcement leadership makes a lot of sense but I think there's a real opportunity for major chiefs association international association of chiefs of police to um, be more honest about how little we know about the efficacy of most law enforcement training and I think one of the challenges someone said this phrase about something being politically inability of political systems to disinvest in police did you say that or did you say that it's very hard. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully said. And so I think it really does require police leadership um, to, to boldly be honest about what we do and don't know. But one of the challenges in the conversation is that it gets personalized and villainized and people talk about police as individuals rather than policing as the institution of policing. And my hope is that we can elevate the conversation to talk about systems rather than the individuals that get used in this polarizing political um, conversation. I don't know of any international examples, but I think it's important to recognize how unique the U.S. is in, um, in the prevalence of guns, and I think uh, the ability to make comparisons in some ways is limited by that, and this idea of dangerousness and um, the racialization of that. So um, I'm going to keep looking, and if I find something good, I'll circle back. I would just say really fast, I think that when there's a weapon involved, my opinion, the best thing to do would be to send, even if you can co-responder model, use a police officer who's trained in CIT and de-escalation training, has a history of using non-lethal force first, plain clothed in an unmarked vehicle, but with at least one mental health professional, um, who, and have that de-escalation training both individuals frequently. Uh, so there's not a lot of research actually in de-escalation um, being effective. There's just not been a lot of research done. Um, and everybody needs to stay safe, but that's how I would approach it. Good. Good. Right. Um, well, real quickly, uh, I, the difficulty with folks who are deaf, Having the responders know about the issue is probably better than trying to treat all, to have all the responders try to say, you know, you should look out for this, and here's how you tell if it exists, and all that kind of stuff. Um, on weapons, it, 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 I agree. There's a lot to unpack there, and you know, also included in this is people who are suicidal. There's a lot of calls that uh, police get, or 911 gets anyway, and police respond to about folks who are suicidal and. So that's another level of complexity, and you know, I think we at the Veterans Center sort of come to the place that you know, you should, no matter what the what what the situation is, it's probably a pretty good idea to see if there's a response to somebody's suicide. You know, again, you have to somebody has to assess the public safety danger, and that's a, that's tough to do. Um, uh, finally, uh, you know, in other countries, like you know, someone sent me an article recently about. Um, I think it was Australia, New Zealand, where you know, someone with a gun, which I think is pretty rare, or a weapon, I mean, they have a shit, I can't remember. But, you know, there's a police set up a perimeter, and they just wait them out for days. You know, that's a different kind of response, but it's, you know, it's culturally I think, dictated. I, on the, you know, are there mental health systems that have sort of stepped up to the plate and engaged law enforcement? I think the sad story is that law enforcement has been much, the law enforcement community has been much more responsible <laughs> in its approach to these folks, like taking them seriously and trying to think about and create something. The mental health community, I mean, they deal with it. 
It's not like this, you know, they're part of the system, and the system makes its efforts and has some successes and, you know, and, and, and lots of failures. And, and as I said, there's a tendency to sort of ignore the population and be happy that someone else is dealing with them. So I think it, it happens, I've seen it happen, you know, that the system will focus on this more challenging population. But um, it's sad to say, but it's also, I think, a credit to the law enforcement world, because I think they're showing more, um, more interest and responsibility than the general citizen. Thanks, Robert. We could have done this for three hours. <laughs> Please join me in thanking this opportunity.